One of the most high-profile Republican lawmakers on Capitol Hill is getting out of politics. South Carolina Congressman Trey Gowdy, who is a former federal prosecutor, says he is returning to the justice system. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel tells us tonight Gowdy's announcement comes amid partisan warfare with no end in sight and a midterm election looming. I call upon all of us to set aside our differences. Republican leaders hope President Trump's effort to reach across the aisle would lead to lawmakers finding areas of cooperation. But top House Democrats are not changing their tune. Unfortunately, one evening's speech doesn't erase a conflict-ridden, chaotic year that has driven our country even further apart. GOP leaders are facing a wave of retirements with news that House Oversight Chairman Trey Gowdy intends to retire after this term. Gowdy is one of nine House committee chairs announcing they won't seek re-election, so their focus is on getting things done, not the rigors of a campaign. Republican lawmakers intend to set their agenda for the rest of 2018, trying to leave unified on what can be accomplished. Uh, we will be spending extended time around the uh, infrastructure question, workforce development, as well as uh, the budget process itself. One area expected to attract Democrat support is on rebuilding the nation's crumbling infrastructure. We've been through so many other battles that we haven't had the time to get into the details on infrastructure. Hopefully we get the ability to start putting the real meat on the bone. But the House Democrat leader mocked the president's mm -hmm. proposal. The president presents himself as a man of big ideas. And then he presents a lame, puny infrastructure uh, challenge, um, proposal. Facing a government funding deadline next week and a DACA deadline in early March, a key Senate Republican says it's time for Democrats to get serious. We have to do something on the border, and we want to make sure that on March 5th or whenever, we don't have 600, 670,000 people that are in school or currently employed lose their work status. Adding to the deadline pressure, the Congressional Budget Office said late today lawmakers would likely need to raise the debt ceiling in early March. The previous estimate was Congress had until late March or early April. Brett? Mike Emanuel, live on the Hill. Mike, thanks. Before we cover the speech some more, let's take a test. In terms of success, who would you rather be? This or this. It's good to start with perspective, given that most polls show widespread approval, upwards of 75 percent for Trump's speech. Still, the loyal opposition couldn't let go of their emotionally clouded bias. As Trump mentioned good news, they frowned. One clown even bolted when a patriotic chant broke out, and they speak of division. They, stat, they sat when they should have stood, even for the flag. You think Americans didn't notice that? Trump placed that moment right in our faces. The Dems are confused. Trump's hitting all the high notes, and they don't know what to do. They're officially Dean Warmer from Animal House, always scowling at good news. Schumer looked like he didn't know whether to wind his watch or cry. Pelosi looks like she discovered her chauffeur had just broken wind. And when Trump called out socialism, half the Dems looked nervously toward the exits. Someone should have checked on Bernie Sanders. Did he expire from too much common sense? If the old saying is true, that progressivism is the fear that someone somewhere is making America look good, then this was a really bad night for progressives. That's why the media couldn't handle it either. Immigration is his one opportunity to have a big success quickly. But I have to tell you, I think his rhetoric last night set things back, did not advance the ball forward. Calling this a healing speech is almost like calling going on a diet by drinking a Diet Coke and eating a pizza. That's as much of a healing speech as this was. You tell me what about this that speech? that room is supposed to respond like this to the great dictator? That was like her when he was running. So Trump set a trap for the Dems and the media that exposed their biases. But hey, everyone has a role to play, and in team sport politics, someone's got to be the loser. Pelosi, Schumer, the hapless media, they do it all so well. All right, Jesse, is, uh, what do you make of the, do you think the Democrats should have been more gracious or is this to be expected? Remember, there were people that were like this with Obama. I mean, there were people that shouted at Obama during one uh, specific event that I can't remember. You lie. Yes, you lie. <laughs> Joe Wilson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just think the Democrats look like the media out of touch with the American people. If you have snap polls saying that they thought it was unifying, uplifting, yeah. 
and he deserves more credit for the good success of America. And then the media is saying it's gloomy, it's dark, it's poisonous. There's a huge disconnect. You had Frank Luntz and Zogby, two big time pollsters, both say home run. And if he can continues to perform like this, the Republican Party may save the House and the Senate, and he's going to even win re-election. But not only did they not clap at some of those moments you just brought up about the rising wages and more jobs, they didn't clap when there was talk about a pathway to citizenship, lowering drug prices. They didn't clap about destroying ISIS. Mm -hmm. They didn't clap about the recovery of Steve Scalise, one of their own colleagues. Think about Unbelievable. that. Unbelievable. So, it, it, it's almost like you could applause the success. I think they did. Not did. what I saw. Not what I saw. Okay. Check the tape. Right. But you can still <laughs> applaud the success of America. But you don't have to agree with everything Trump says. It's almost like they care more about their party than they do about the country. Imagine if the Democrats didn't clap when we won gold medal in the Olympics because Trump was president. That's kind of the disconnect. But the president's done something very skillful here. He's so closely associated himself with the flag, with the country, and the economic success. When the Democrats root against him, they look like they're rooting against America. But he's also triangulated when it comes to manufacturing, infrastructure, and trade that helps American workers. So the Democrats are in a tough position where they're boxed in. Are they going to choose what's good for their own base? Or are they going to follow Nancy and crying Chuck? And that's the question going into the midterms. That's actually, I didn't even consider that, uh, Dana. What, the point Jesse says that he has aligned himself with patriotic symbols so that if you are against him, you're kind of against the flag. In, in a way, it's almost a parallel that if you were against President Obama, yeah. you're racist. Yeah. So it's kind of like you align yourself with certain kinds of, yeah. I, 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 in his case, identity politics. In this case, unification, patriotism. Yeah, I was thinking when they didn't stand for, um, when the Democrats didn't stand, well, not I shouldn't say didn't. I, I had a Democrat on my show today who did stand for rising wages, uh, so I'll take it back. And it, um, they they are lacking a message, though, and they don't have the bully pulpit. And they know that in their in their districts, um, all of these citizens are seeing good headlines about the economy. Mm -hmm. So there is a disconnect. So for people who watch the speech, most of those tend to be people who like the president anyway. They're like they're going forward and the Democrats are starting to lose ground in the congressional ballot. Republicans have made up considerable ground in in just a month. Um, I think what the Democrats could have done from a communication standpoint is just stood up and cheered and applauded and given a, a high fives to each other saying, we did this for you. Congra we are we are happy to have helped you, President Trump, to inherit this great economy. And we are absolutely going for going to go forward to try to win back the working class. And also take credit for some of these centrist and Democratic ideas that he floated. Sure, like paid family leave. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, there's some liberal stuff going in there, Kimberly. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, though, that Dana brings up a great point, which is that there was plenty there for them to say, hey, listen, we were contributory to this. We helped. We're trying to get the, uh, the country to prosper as it relates to the economy as well and tax reform, et cetera. But instead, they chose to be partisan and not to be honest in terms of, okay, this is what's happened. This is what we feel we've tried to contribute. This is what is, in fact, good for the country. They did not want to even begrudgingly give kind of any credit or acknowledge any participation because to give him any credit for honest-to-God achievements was too much for them to swallow. Juan, you're batting clean up here. Why does your side look like a bunch of sore losers? You get 10 seconds. <laughs> That's what I thought. Here we are on Fox. Let me just say. Oh, let me we just give say, you more time than anybody oh, on the yeah. planet. Let me, just, let me just say, I'm so <laughs> curious in listening because, for example, with the young man mm -hmm. uh, and the flags at the graves, right? right? How can you guys not see that he's going after people who say, I'm having a legitimate protest about police brutality by refusing... Uh, to stand at the national anthem. That's a choice that people are making. But what Trump has done is he has now demonized anybody who doesn't stand with this little boy who's bringing flags to a grave. How can you not do it? Well, can well, I, I tell you how you can't do it because you're so upset and you want America to know that there's police brutality in the world. Right. But, and similarly, let me just say, with regard to wages, yes. how can you not say, oh, Trump says, Wages are up under me. Guess what? Wages have been rising since 2014. You're doing How that about, in the e-block. I'm just telling you <laughs> that there is so much yeah. here that Trump steers and distorts and twists. And you guys say, oh, 
He's patriotic. Everything uh, is great. I just think it's, you know. All right, but nuts. I just want to get to respond to that. I got to move on. You, you compare it to, to uh, uh, um, ideas, okay? So in, in Trump's case, he has this, this young boy on to talk about this amazing thing he's doing. That is a well-articulated principle that he's espousing. He's showing this. The, the kneeling stuff was poorly articulated. Nobody really knew what it meant. They ha it had to, I, people had to keep repeating it over and over again. And it became a question of patriotism, not a question of brutality. If they had done something towards the... If they'd gone to their police department and protested there... That would make sense. That's why you, you, you're comparing a well-articulated vision with one that was convoluted, and they're wrapping it. It wasn't convoluted. You forget, it, Colin Kaepernick talk? was very plain in saying why he was doing it. It didn't work. I, well, mean, it it, I don't know if you think it worked or not, but I'm going to tell you, a lot of people are sensitive Listen, to the argument. He was on of, the cover of, of GQ. Yeah, and a lot of people are more sensitive and more aware now because of Black Lives Matter and Colin Kaepernick. Juan's defending Democrats, not standing for the flag. Let him. For the flag. Also, Let Jesse him. pointed out to me on the sheet, it says that Democrats did not stand for Steve Scalise. I, I thought that I saw that. I saw they people did, stand. I, I don't know what's going on. They might have they applauded. Didn't. They didn't stand. But this is where we are in America. Yeah, this is grievance politics. You get graded politics. on where, you, where your yes. posture.